All right, well, we continue in the book of Revelation as we get into chapter 1, verse 8. The Alpha and the Omega is who we're talking about. So Jesus claims the name Yahweh, claiming to be God, basically. This is something we see in the Old Testament, I am. Moses, want to know, who am I going to tell to send? send them to, tell them that I am sent you. Let's look at verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Father God, we just pray that you speak to us through your word and allow us to understand better about you and who you are, the great I am. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Some people say you're not supposed to mess with this book, and I've probably messed with it a little too much. Uh, especially in Wednesday nights. But this is the practical parts of the book of Revelation that we're looking at. Not getting caught up in all the weird stuff that we try to figure out and debate about. Understanding it, focusing on the practical side. So Jesus came announcing himself as the I Am. Before Abraham was, he told the, the, the guys that were trying to argue with him, I Am. That's what made everybody mad. Because God said that about himself. Who is Jesus to say, I am? Then, if you read in the Gospel of John, and we went through the Gospel of John years ago, Jesus made a bunch of I am statements. He said, I am the bread. I am the light. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the true vine. Over and over, he kept saying, I am. No wonder everybody was so angry at him, because if you're a rabbi, if you're a Pharisee, if you're anybody of the Bible, when somebody says, I am, you're saying, I am God. That was how they knew him. So let's talk about the Alpha and Omega. What in the world does he mean by that? So I am the Alpha and Omega. So the Alpha and the Omega are the first letters of the alphabet, the Greek alphabet. He's, the Lord is saying, I am the A to the Z, basically. I am the beginning, I am the end. I am everything that makes up everything. I am Him. So the Lord's announcement, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. See, that, that right there, Jesus is the one who knows all things. Jesus is the one from the beginning. Jesus was the one who created. Je Jesus is a part of all of it. We saw this in Hebrews as well. So Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. So there you go. I already got you. You're already on your path to understanding the Greek language. Alpha. All right. So, and then when you get to the omega, that's when you get to the end. So alpha and omega, alpha being the beginning, omega being the last, those letters are the, and encompass every letter in between and make up and express the idea of all mankind's knowledge. So if you are the beginning of the alphabet to the end of the alphabet, and you make up all the letters of the alphabet, then you make up all the words. You make up all the sentences. You make up all the stories. You make up everything. You are, I don't say not make up, but you are an essence of all these things. That's his way of saying, I am everything. I am all things. I know everything. Jesus lets us know that he is an omniscient God. He sees all. He knows all. I'm not just some guy that came and taught a bunch of lessons and then the Romans took me and executed me in front of the Jews. That's not who I am. I am the I am. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the one who is and the one who was and the one who is to come, the Almighty. I'm the beginning. I'm the end. I'm the A to the Z. I'm everything you got. I'm everything you need. Hebrews said, I'm the sustainer of all things. He's the one who started the universe. He's the one who sustains the universe. He's the one that pilots everything. He's the one that keeps the sun just in the right position, that if it moved just a little bit, we'd all be fried, or if it moved a little bit the other way, we'd all freeze to death. He's the one that sustains that. He's the one that hung it. He's the one that put it in place. We got people here that's going to be reading this stuff in pagan worlds who worship the sun, and he's saying, I am the one who created all these things. I mean, they worship the moon. He said, I'm the one that makes the moon stay in its orbit. I, I, they, they look to the stars and look around. And he's like, I'm the one who hung the stars. I'm the one that know how, knows how every bit of this works. I'm the one who's in control. I am the Lord. 
That's what he's saying. So, interesting when he says, which is, which was, and which is to come, showing his authority. With this phrase, he is proclaiming his deity as well. He's saying, I'm God. There's all kinds of people to say, Jesus never said he was God. You're not reading all of it. I don't know what you're reading, but when you get into places like the book of Revelation, he says, I am. That's a direct statement. He is God. The one who is, who was, and is to come is a direct statement that he is a deity. He is God himself. He has the authority to do all things he has come to do, and he will do, and things that he will come to pass in this book. In other words, he will see to it that all the things that he planned, all the things that he started, he's going to finish it. We serve a Savior. When He starts something, He completes it. He finishes it. And He, and the, everything that was foretold in this book, and we're talking about the book of Revelation, but everything that was foretold in this book will come to pass just like He said. You and I may not understand it all. Goodness sakes, if we think we understand the book of Revelation, we are just lying to ourselves. I thought I understood it until I started teaching through it. I'm more confused than anybody. And that's sad. And some of y'all said, we can tell. I don't hide it. And if I do, I don't hide it well. Okay? It's deep. It's stuffed in here. I don't get. But it's all going to come to completion. And one day, all of us are going to sit back. Everybody from prophecy teachers to, to whether, no matter what your end time view is or what your view is of the book of Revelation, when we're all going to get to heaven and we're going to look back and we're going to go, wow, that's how that worked. Well, that makes perfect sense now. Because we're all real good at it when we're the Monday morning quarterback, you know. Hindsight, 2020, and all that. So, don't worry, child of God, about how things are going to turn out because you're not the one in control of all things turning out the way they're supposed to. Our Lord and Savior is. The Lord is the Almighty. Okay? Right, he said that right there at the end. The Almighty means he's the one who holds sway over all things. All that stuff we worry about and we fret about, he's got sway over that. All these things in this world, and the wars and rumors of wars and the things on the news and the things going on, he, he's the Almighty. At 9-11, somebody famously asked a pastor, and I wish I could give credit to who it was, I just don't know who it was. He said, where was your God when those planes flew into the towers? And the pastor said, same place he was when his son hung on the cross and died for your sins. He's on his throne. See, even though the world may be chaotic and things going crazy around us, he's still the Almighty. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's the one with the authority. He's the one that's going to proclaim and make everything work out in the end. And right now it may be hard, and right now it may be difficult, but the time is coming. The time is coming when he sets everything right, when he establishes his kingdom, when he rules and reigns in all of his authority, because he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the one who is, who was, and who is to come. He is the Almighty. He is the one we lean to. It proclaims him to be the sovereign Lord. He's the sovereign Lord over the universe. He's the sovereign Lord over our lives. He's sovereign Lord over everything. And he is the one who is able to bring everything that he has planned and promised to pass. See, Jesus still got stuff working behind the scenes. There's things God has done that there's still a whole lot of stuff behind the scenes of it. And when the time is right, all these things are going to be going to come to be, come to pass. And, and he'll be able to stop whatever that it is that's bothering us. And he'll, it's kind of like with, um, there's an English story about King Richard, King Richard the Lionhearted. It's where the story of Robin Hood comes from. There's a lot of stories, a lot of legends, a lot of myths that come out of King Richard's story. But King Richard went off to fight a holy war, and while he was gone, his brother took over his kingdom. And his brother took over his kingdom, John, was a horrible ruler and did horrible things while he was gone. But the day came when King Richard came home. And when he came home, the lion-hearted marched right through the kingdom. Nobody dared stop him. Marched right up to his throne. His brother and nobody stood in his way, and he took his rightful place on the throne. 
and he began to rule as king of England again, and his brother was banished. That's the way it's going to be one day for you and me. One day, Jesus is going to march right back into this world that he created and he established and that he started that has turned into such chaos because of the, the devil and Satan and you and me and everybody else. We have just wrecked it. And he's going to march in and he's going to sit on his throne and he's going to establish his kingdom and he's going to create everything the way it was supposed to be. And it's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and everything's going to be reestablished and Eden is going to be reestablished and all of this stuff's going to be fit back to the way it was the beginning and the end, the creator and the judge. Our Lord is a great beginner and finisher of all things he started. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were complete. You see, he completed this work. He brought order out of chaos. People say all this order came out of chaos only because God made order out of chaos creating plants, creating animals, creating Adam, creating Eve, setting all of this stuff up. And then the redemption is the finished product. Look at John 19.30. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. This is connected to the work that he began in creation. Jesus wasn't surprised that he was going to have to die for us. That was always in the plan. He always knew he'd had to do that. He's sovereign Lord. He's the creator of all. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He always was. So they didn't take, Jesus didn't say, oh man, look what Adam and Eve did. They messed everything up. I guess somebody's going to have to go die. Who's going to go die? Well, none of y'all are worthy. I guess I'll do it. No, it was always in the plan. It was always in the plan. And when Jesus hung there on the cross. This is what he said. It is finished. The work was complete. Everything, redemption was finished. Prophecies of the coming Redeemer, the birth of the Lord Jesus in Bethlehem, the ministry of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, all of it was in the plan. All of it is a finalization of everything. That he, this the blueprints of what had to happen to make man right with God again. But we're still waiting for something else. We're waiting for him to come back. Because when he ascended after the resurrection and he went up to heaven, the angels proclaimed, he's going to come back in the way you see him ascending. See, that's the thing you and I are waiting for, is the coming Savior. All the prophecies about him coming the first time were fulfilled. And I've shared with you before, there's eight times as many say he's coming the second time. They'll be fulfilled. He also finishes his work in you. So that's the thing, Baptists. We tend to, somebody gets saved. <clears throat> and we think that's it. Hey, man, they got saved. That's good. They can go to heaven now. They can go live like whatever and do whatever and never have anything to do with the Lord. But hey, they got saved. No, you understand that salvation is you got saved, you're being saved, you are saved. It is a process of sanctification throughout your life. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. I'm sure of this, that He, Jesus, who started a good work in you, salvation, will carry it out on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. So this work that God started in us, this work of salvation in us, He's not through. He has not finished. You're not dead yet. You're not gone yet. Jesus hadn't come back yet. He's going to carry it out to the day of com completion. So here we have that the work of salvation that was began in the beginning of all of us, He's not through with us till our last breath. So we're absent from the body to be present with the Lord. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are His workmanship. We're all in a process. Created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. Which God prepared ahead of time. Again, none of it caught God by surprise. 
ahead of time, He prepared all this for us to do. So we are His workmanship. We are His project. God finishes what He starts. Now, you know, some of us, we're bad to start a project and not finish. Anybody know how that is? You start working on something, and you never go back to it. If you're like me, you watched a YouTube video on how to take it apart. And then you did. And the YouTube video didn't help me put it back together. And so it's broken. I can't fix it. I don't know what to do. I call Larry. I call somebody else. Usually I make a mess of something. I try to finish all the things I start. But in human nature, there's a lot of things we start we never finish. God's not like us. God started the work of salvation. God, listen, the big problem that we got, <clears throat> when God created all things, He sat back and He looked and He saw that it was good. And then it got messed up. Eden was this special place, this realm between heaven and earth, where God would dwell with humans. We messed it up. Do you think God's through with Eden? You better not think that for a second. God's going to reclaim Eden. He's doing that through His Son, the second Adam. The first Adam messed it up. The second Adam is Jesus Christ. And He's going to create it. He's going to fix it. He's going to make it all right. God hasn't lost sight of Eden. He's going to reestablish it. God's not through with you. You might get backslidden. You might walk away from the Lord. You might. God's not. You're still a workmanship of His. You're still in the process of what He's doing with you. And then He's the one who is to come. Let's look at that other part. <clears throat> I'm losing my voice. In 1.8 of Revelation. The one who is, the one who was, and who is to come. Okay. The one who died and rose again. Say, don't, don't lose sight of that. It's huge that He rose again. If He didn't, if he had no resurrection, none of this matters. So, what will happen when He comes? Because that's what we're waiting for. We're waiting for Him to come back. There's a couple of hints in the Bible. And let's look at them. One of them is when the dead in Christ rise first. It comes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16. And then we'll look at 17. But let's look at 16 for a second. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice. Okay? So He's coming back. And with the trumpet of God. And we see all this in the book of Revelation much later. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And I told you all about the, the Church of God pastor who told me that the Baptists were all going to rise first because the Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first. Um, I, I said, I hope so. But uh, So he's going to come back with a shout of a voice of an archangel. The trumpet's going to blow and the dead in Christ will rise. All right? Verse 17. Then, so that's all the believers are going to be rising up. So then we who are still alive. So if the Lord came back right now, dead in Christ rise up, then we, what happens to us? Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together. You understand, Paul was dealing with a group of people that thought they missed Jesus coming back. And they're like, what do we do? Apparently we missed Jesus coming back. And he's like, no, 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 you wouldn't have missed this. Because you're going to have the dead rise first. And then you're going to get called up to meet them there. You ain't got nothing to do with it. He's going to do it all. You didn't miss nothing, okay? I don't want you to be ignorant, brothers and sisters, about this mystery. He's going to come back, and it's going to be a show, okay? So those of us that are still alive will be caught up with them in the clouds. To meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. All right. So believers get to go and meet their Savior. You know what this is? He started this work. He's going to finish this work. That's what we're waiting on. We're just waiting on Him to finish. And we need to be looking for Him to come back. I promise you. The stuff you may be struggling with and dealing with, if you think about Him coming back and that He is going to come back, whether it's in your lifetime or the, 
generations from now, and you don't know, I don't know, Jesus doesn't know, only God knows. That gives you hope to continue to know my God is not through with the things he has started. He is not finished. That's a lot to look forward to. And every bit of it is going to happen as it was promised. Why? Because he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. How are you going to be sure that you're going to meet him when he comes? You're not, unless you have given your life to him. You will not be a part of what we're talking about unless you surrender your life to the Lord Jesus. That's the thing. He's the Lord and he's the master. You have to give yourself over to him. You have to accept what he has done for you. He's a free gift, but you still have to receive the gift. I've, I've said this before. If I say, here, I have a gift for you. I want to give you this. You can reject the gift. You don't have to take it. You can say, no, thank you. I don't want any gifts. If I take that gift from you, you're going to hold it over my head, or I'll, I'll have to get you a gift. I don't want to take a gift from you and have to buy you a gift, too. How about you just keep your gift? I don't want to have to do anything. You don't need to do that. You rejected my gift. There were no strings attached. If I'm giving you this, you don't have to give me something in return. You, but... Jesus is that gift. And for whatever reason, some people just won't receive it. They won't say, yes, I will receive that precious gift of salvation. I will receive what you have done. And I guess it's because we don't want to make Him Lord and Master of our lives. But when you're the Alpha and the Omega, you're the Lord and Master. Anything less than that, is not salvation. So if you need the Lord Jesus and you want to be a part of His coming, you need to surrender and say, You are my Lord. You are the great I Am. You are the Alpha and Omega. You are the one who is, who was, and is to come. And I want to give my life to you. That's salvation. Father God, <clears throat> we thank you for salvation. We thank you that you've been in control of all of this this whole time. We thank you that the only way to God the Father in heaven is through you. Many reject it, but help us to receive it. Help anyone in here that does not know you to know you, to surrender their life to you, to, to take the free gift of salvation that you have offered and receive it and have a newness of life. Would you stand with us?